did not stop SpaceX from breaking regulations, then find them. That is just one of several childish behaviors that the FAA has recently done to revenge on SpaceX on the threshold of the national election. All of that was exposed, frankly, by Elon Musk in a series of tweets. In today's episode of TechMap, let's take a look at the key points in the escalating battle between SpaceX and the FAA, the root cause of the conflict, and more. But before we begin, let's subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with the latest space news. The $633,000 fine that the FAA proposes against SpaceX seems to be the final straw in the nasty relationship between the national agency and the rocket company. On September 19, SpaceX sent a letter to Congress voicing its concerns with the FAA's inability to keep pace with the commercial spaceflight industry. Elon Musk reposted and said, the FAA news leadership spends their resources attacking SpaceX for petty matters that have nothing to do with safety while neglecting real safety issues at Boeing. This is deeply wrong and puts human lives at risk. And he has previously said he will file a lawsuit against the FAA. Clearly, these fierce acts of resistance by the billionaire are just a question of time before he and his company lose patience with the U.S. national agency. Bear in mind that just several days ago, SpaceX got an unexpected gift from the FAA with the announcement to delay Starship Flight 5 to November. Some believe that the reason for Musk's anger with the FAA this time is still regulatory. SpaceX CEO has never hidden his hatred for regulations and in recent years has openly broken them across all his companies. However, in Elon's words, everything this time is not as simple as this, as he points his finger at the political motivation of the FAA. I am highly confident that discovery will show improper politically motivated behavior by the FAA. Suing means that SpaceX will go through the discovery process with the FAA, which means their lawyers get to look at a lot of internal material, like internal communications. They are doing this because they hope to uncover evidence of political lobbying against SpaceX. To add more certainty, we can clearly see that the time when SpaceX is under constant government attack is when the U.S. is on the threshold of the national election. Of course, that's no coincidence. On July 13th, shortly after Trump survived an assassination attempt, Musk stated, I fully endorse President Trump. This endorsement is significant, as it aligns Musk with a Republican candidate. Since the tech billionaire endorsed Trump on July 13th, the campaign of Vice President Kamala Harris has repeatedly attacked Musk for his anti-worker stances. The campaign has called Musk and Trump self-obsessed rich guys and reposted audio from an event on Musk's social media app, X, in which the two laugh together about firing striking workers. You, you're the greatest cutter. I mean, I look at what you do. You walk in and you just say, you want to quit? They go <laughs> yeah. on strike. They, I won't mention the name of the company, but they go on strike and you say, that's okay, you're all gone. Every time that Elon Musk tries to do something to help Donald Trump, I think it fires up the Democratic base to work against him, said Pete Giangreco, a Democratic strategist based in Chicago. Well, I believe Pete Giangreco's comment is completely valid. On August 12th, CNBC published a controversial article criticizing Elon Musk's SpaceX for violating regulations regarding water use and discharge during Starship testing and launch processes. Notably, this story is written by Laura Kolodny, an author infamous for her attack article aimed at Musk and his companies. On the same day, the FAA suddenly announced a postponement of hearings on an environmental review linked to SpaceX's plans to increase the number of Starship launches from its South Texas facility. In the comment section, many people left the question, why, since the FAA did not initially explain why it postponed the meetings. Later, the FAA explained that the FAA is seeking additional information from SpaceX before rescheduling the public meetings. Although SpaceX came out to correct the news, News, saying CNBC's story on Starship's launch operations in South Texas is factually inaccurate, it's clear that this didn't work. The plot thickens, as on September 12th, SpaceX received a Starship Flight 5 launch license date estimate of late November from the FAA, a more than two-month delay to the previously communicated date of mid-September. This delay was not based on a new safety concern, but instead driven by what SpaceX called superfluous environmental analysis. Elon Musk angrily posted on X, we will never get humanity to Mars if this continues. That coincided with a hearing by the House Space Subcommittee where members and industry officials criticized the FAA's implementation of a new set of launch licensing regulations, known as Part 450, making the companies difficult to obtain licenses. The situation continues to escalate. On Tuesday, September 17th, the FAA announced that it plans to fine SpaceX $630,000 for violating its launch license during the Falcon 9 
and Falcon Heavy launches in 2023. In response, SpaceX contends that the FAA was involved in decisions leading to one of the violations and allowed the launch to proceed. SpaceX was operating under a specific launch license revision that required its launch control room to be located in NASA's facility. The company submitted a new plan to relocate its control room and eliminate a required T2 hour readiness poll, but the FAA did not approve this in time for a scheduled launch on June 18, 2023. Despite this, SpaceX proceeded with the launch, arguing that the FAA had sufficient time to approve the changes and that no safety issues arose from their actions. As a result, the FAA fined SpaceX $350,000 for this violation. During the July 29, 2023 launch of Falcon Heavy's Jupiter 3, SpaceX used a new RP-1 propellant farm without proper approval beyond a waiver granted for Crew-7's launch. SpaceX claims that an FAA representative did not halt operations during the countdown and that discussions with FAA leadership indicated agreement on the safety of proceeding with the launch. The FAA fined SpaceX $283,009 for this infraction. Elon Musk responded to the news that same day, declaring on X that the company intends to sue the FAA for regulatory overreach. Simultaneously, he spoke up to criticize the double standard in enforcing regulations on Boeing and SpaceX by the FAA through various tweets, saying NASA deemed the Boeing capsule unsafe for astronaut return, turning out of necessity to SpaceX. Yet instead of fining Boeing for putting astronauts at risk, the FAA is fining SpaceX for trivia. Not only double standard, but the FAA is also indeed known for its slow processing times and regulatory inefficiencies, primarily attributed to being understaffed. The idea that SpaceX can build a giant rocket faster than the FAA can shuffle paperwork is ridiculous. Elon ironically shared that Flight 5 is built and ready to fly. Flight 6 will be ready to fly before Flight 5 even gets approved by FAA. More ironically, they start to prepare for Flight 8 by rolling the Starship 34 nose cone into the high bay before stacking it onto the payload section. During the hearing on October 2023, William Gerstenmeier, Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability at SpaceX, recommended that the FAA double the staff in the licensing division of its Office of Commercial Space Transportation, which is known as AST. In addition, the FAA should be given accelerated hiring authority to draw from the best pool of candidates. Congress approved an increase in funding for the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation to $42 million for fiscal year 2024. In the last year, the FAA's space office has added approximately 35 workers, bringing the total staffing level to 158 employees. However, you know, there is still some chaos somewhere inside the FAA, making it difficult to review SpaceX's Starship proposed launch program. Congressman Keith Sell also mentioned that in a letter he sent to Congress on September 17th, strongly encouraging the FAA to accelerate its unnecessarily prolonged review of SpaceX's Starship proposed launch program. Elon replied, much appreciated. Honestly, the FAA is just a representative of the bureaucracy existing in the government, smothering the evolution of spaceflight. It explains why we have a tweet of Elon Musk posted on September 14th. Starship will make life multiplanetary, preserving life as no from extinction events on Earth, so long as it is not smothered by bureaucracy. There is more government regulatory smothering every year. If this continues, all large projects in the United States will be illegal. For example, look at the farcically slow build of the high-speed rail line in California. After spending several billion dollars over many years, there is almost no progress. The Department of Government Efficiency is the only path to extending life beyond Earth. Anyway, the government needs SpaceX, much like SpaceX needs the government. Imagine what if without SpaceX? The obvious truth is that without SpaceX, the U.S. Space Agency would likely be far behind what it is today. At that point, we might still be flying on a Russian rocket engine, still learning Russian to be allowed to fly on the Soyuz spacecraft to the ISS. That is certainly not a bright future. We know that since 2022, Roscosmos desired to end a decades-long relationship between U.S. and Russian rocket makers. They have decided to stop supplying its RD 180 rocket engines to the United States in retaliation for sanctions imposed on Russia over its invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Now, one seat on the Soyuz costs NASA $86 million, whereas the cost of one spacecraft ship from SpaceX will cost $55 million. SpaceX's Starship Flight 5 has recently made headlines by being delayed two months due to the FAA's regulations.
action instead of the time frame in mid-September that the FAA previously targeted for determining whether to approve a launch license for the next Starship flight, Flight 5 won't happen no earlier than late November. The primary reason is SpaceX's modification for the next Starship test flight, which requires consultation with other agencies. The FAA, in a separate statement on September 11th, noted that the license the FAA issued for Starship's previous launch in June allowed for multiple flights using the same profile, but SpaceX modified the profile for the next launch and also provided information only in mid-August about how the environmental impact of Flight 5 will cover a larger area than previously reviewed. One of those changes is that the booster itself will return to land back on shore in Texas, rather than off the coast in the Gulf of Mexico, as it did in June, which will expose a larger area to a sonic boom. Thus, the FAA has to approve another 60-day consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to look at the sonic boom's effect on animals, according to SpaceX. In addition, there was concern about wastewater discharge from the pad's water deluge system, leading to the fines by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and the Environmental Protection Agency this year. But in SpaceX's words, they were entirely tied to disagreements over paperwork and not any dumping of pollutants in water from the launch pad into the environment around the Starship launch site. The FAA's explanation comes after criticism from SpaceX, which said the delay was not based on new safety concerns, but instead on unnecessary environmental analysis. Otherwise, the FAA said SpaceX could use the same launch license used for the fourth launch if the company employed the same vehicle configuration and mission profile. Of course, it doesn't totally fit SpaceX's goal to progress over each flight. Especially, they need to make Starship reliable as soon as possible to keep up with the tight timeline of the national missions, NASA's Artemis 3, for instance. Anyway, the hope now is that both the FAA and Fish and Wildlife, etc., can take less than 60 days to finish their evaluation. It's a big deal because as FAA is well known for the slow processing of launch license applications and lack of resources for oversight of commercial space activity. Or SpaceX could come up with another solution to decrease the FAA's concerns about the potential impact of the sonic boom during Super Heavy's return in the future. As you might know, besides the idea of using chopstick, there are another two landing scenarios. It's landing on a drone ship, a floating platform in the ocean. This method has become a SpaceX trademark with the Falcon 9's boosters, and for Starship, it promises flexibility in landing site selection. Landing on a drone ship allows SpaceX to easily position and recover the launch vehicle, especially during missions far from shore. The final option, known as controlled soft landing, serves as a backup in case the other methods aren't feasible. This is a destructive scenario where the rocket is intentionally landed in the ocean and is not recovered. SpaceX successfully tested a soft landing during Starship's fourth flight by the virtual tower, and landing on Mechazilla's arms is a familiar concept and a must-achieve goal for SpaceX. So what if we combine those two options? At this point, the booster can land on a floating platform in the Gulf of Mexico somewhere, assuming that SpaceX built a Mechazilla tower on said platform, and likely on a larger drone ship than is currently used for the Falcon 9 first stage. A conventional launch mission will leave the stage with close to as little fuel as possible by the time it detaches in order to be efficient, but it does not make sense to waste a significant amount of fuel, up to 10% to make that return to Boca Chica. That number matters while 80% of the fuel is consumed in the first place, and the booster just has 20% remaining for in-flight activities. An advantage of an autonomous spaceport drone ship, ASDS, is the vessel can be positioned near the spaceport, so it's far cheaper to bring the rocket back on a ship than to fly it back with fuel. So, they can load only as much fuel as they will need to deliver the payload and then mostly fall and glide for a powered landing on the barge. Thanks to that, the rocket's payload capacity is also enhanced considerably. However, one challenge here is the ocean's instability. So, the rocket is usually affected by ocean waves and other unpredictable sea factors. Thus, the success rate of landing on a drone ship is hard to match with return to the launch site, RTLS, where the landing pad is on solid ground. Furthermore, with the growing size of Super Heavy, it would need a very tall catching structure, which would itself need to be afloat and subject to the vagaries of wave motion, as well as the tough weather conditions, so it would probably need a very large barge indeed to keep it stable, unlike relatively shallow water barges and platforms that can be anchored in or supported from the seabed. Perhaps a deep ocean platform is also an interesting option. For example, Chevron's $500 million Petronius platform is situated about 208 kilometers southeast of New Orleans.
Islands. It is located in water depths of 535 meters. The rig is a compliant tower and is the largest freestanding structure in the world at 613 meters, double the Eiffel Tower. The compliant tower design was chosen for its ability to withstand hurricane conditions and operate in depths of 610 meters. The compliant tower design enables it to move within an envelope of 7.6 meters sway and a 3 meters rotation sway at the surface. Nevertheless, landing the boosters on a drone ship offers other massive benefits, such as flexibility. As a mobile structure, the drone ship can be positioned anywhere in the ocean as long as they don't interfere with other maritime operations. It can serve for suborbital missions, including point-to-point -point travel on Earth and military and civilian missions. SpaceX is able to select the most optimal landing sites for each specific mission. Remember, oceans cover a total of 71% of the Earth's surface, so nothing would be better if there were available locations for launching and landing a starship anywhere in the world. This is useful for starship suborbital missions, which require transporting large numbers of people and cargo over great distances in short periods. Gwyn Shotwell, president and COO of SpaceX, hinted at this during a press conference following her presentation at the FAA Commercial Space Transportation Conference on February 8, 2023. We're going to have a lot of launch pads. I think we're going to have a lot of platforms at sea. We need to see how this vehicle is going to perform. A typical case illustrating SpaceX's ambitions to have a lot of floating platforms worldwide is the company's plan to add one more landing site on Australia's coast and recover it on Australian territory. The launch site remains a SpaceX facility in Texas. This initiative represents a potential expansion of SpaceX's operations in the region, which aligns with broader security and military cooperation between the U.S. and Australia. To facilitate this plan, there is a need to loosen U.S. export controls on advanced space technologies destined for Australia. This adjustment is crucial for ensuring compliance with regulations governing the transfer of sensitive technologies. According to the sources, discussions are in the early stages regarding expanded possibilities. The sources also indicate that towing Starship to a nearby port on Australia's western or northern coasts after an ocean landing or barge landing would be the ideal scenario. However, this also poses some challenges due to the huge size of the rocket, thus more specific plans and locations are still being determined as the talks are ongoing. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.